This picture of Earth was taken on Christmas Day, 1968, by the astronauts of Apollo 8. I was two months old at the time. It was the first time that humans were able to see our home planet as a whole, a blue and white ball suspended in a sea of blackness. All of us, all our dreams and artifacts, and all resources needed for our survival are on this ball. Apollo 8 was a historic mission because it was the first time that we achieved escape velocity and left the gravitational pull of Earth. Earth is the only home we know, and it is the only place that can sustain us, right? Actually, that is no longer quite true. We have created a second home for ourselves. It's called the International Space Station, or ISS for short. ISS orbits the Earth once every 90 minutes. And ISS has housed between three and six astronauts and cosmonauts for the last 15 years without interruption. ISS offers an amazing view of Earth, as shown here from its own observatory known as the Cupola. Since two weeks, everyone can enjoy this view live on the internet in high definition. Now, the ISS, though, is still really close, if you think about it. It is only about 350 kilometers above Earth's surface, and that happens to be almost exactly the east-west distance across Switzerland. The ISS also depends heavily on regular resupply from Earth. Since the start of the program, there have been a total of 144 crewed and cargo flights between five different launch sites on Earth and the ISS to bring hundreds of tons of critical supplies, such as water, oxygen, spares, and scientific equipment. As a result, it has gotten kind of crowded up there. I'm not sure about you, but I lose things all the time in two dimensions. Can you imagine what it would be like in 3D? Since 2008, my group has worked on tracking objects in microgravity with much better precision than we can do today using RFID technology. You can think of the ISS as a technological baby that was born, but whose umbilical cord is still firmly attached to Earth, to Mother Earth. Now, one of my dreams since childhood is that the ISS will not be our final destination. I dream that we will go back to the moon. I dream that we will go to Mars and explore its moons, Phobos and Deimos, and other exciting places in the solar system, such as the large asteroid Ceres or the Galilean moons of Jupiter. And I dream that we will do so with humans alongside their robotic assistants. Now, exploration is short-term. You come, you see, you stay for a while, and then you come back home. I dream that some of us will stay, that future generations will be born, will live, and will die in places like our sister planet Mars. What I am talking about is establishing a permanent, sustainable human presence on another planetary body. And by sustainable, I mean a place that could thrive without an umbilical cord back to Earth. A place that could become a true second home for humanity. And a place that would ensure that over time, we became a true multi-planet species. Now, this dream raises a lot of questions. Why should we do this? Where should we go? And what will it take to succeed? I will now try to answer these questions. Why should we go? Why should we go? It is human nature to explore, as we have done for millennia, and that may be a good reason in itself. But there are several dangers facing humanity today that threaten our very survival. Let me just name four of these. Climatic, irreversible change. Kinetic, 
asteroid impacts, social thermonuclear war, and biological, a killer virus. Each of these has the potential to wipe out our entire civilization and make us extinct. Now, of course, people debate the likelihood and impact of each of these threats, but no one can deny that these are possible. And for some of them, it may not be a question of if, but when. By establishing a permanent human presence outside of Earth, we would ensure our long-term survival and the preservation of our civilization and of our heritage. So, where should we go? Well, you can think of our planet <laughs> as a subway system. Like on the metro, we have stations, we have lines, and we have a fare that needs to be paid. Now, the currency of that fare is called Delta V. It is the change in velocity that needs to be accomplished to reach each station in the solar subway system. For example, to escape Earth, we need to achieve a delta V of 7.8 kilometers per second. The station on the left, Earth, is our home station. From there, we can reach other stations like the Moon, the Lagrangian points, or Mars. Once we reach our destination, what do we need? to survive there. There are three essential resources that we need. Air. We can only survive two to three minutes without it. Water. We can only survive three to four days without it. And food. We can only survive two to three weeks without it. These life-preserving resources need to be provided at the right temperature, pressure, quality, and quantity for us not only to survive, but to thrive. We also need to figure out what to do with the waste that we produce. In that respect, there are only three choices. Storing it, disposing of it, or recycling it. Now, recycling sounds great, and it is a simple idea, but doing it in practice is very challenging. Take a look at the urine processing assembly currently used on the ISS. It does a seemingly simple job, recovering potable water from the astronaut's urine. But doing so safely and repeatedly is very challenging. It takes a dozen carefully synchronized chemical reactions and lots of technology to make it happen. This machine took over $150 million and over a decade to develop. And despite this progress, the recovery rate for water is still less than 90%, and we need to still supply the ISS with fresh water periodically. Now, this seems like a great time to have a drink. <laughs> Let me see. Hmm. Hmm. Let me rinse that down. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Did he really just drink somebody's pee? Don't worry, this is apple juice. That was bought at a local grocery store. However, if this building was a lunar base, all of us would be drinking each other's pee every day, after it had been cleaned up, of course. So, since there are no grocery stores in space, at least not yet, this leads us to the notion of an interplanetary supply chain. What we envision is a supply chain that extends beyond low Earth orbit to the Moon, to Mars, and beyond. Shown here is a supply chain to Mars. It combines resupply from Earth, recycling, and local production in new ways. This model was developed using a software program called SpaceNet that, we, that we've developed in my group. It may be surprising, but in some cases, 
it is better to mine fuels on the surface of the moon and transport them back to Earth orbit rather than launching them directly from Earth. Now, this sounds great. So why are we not there yet? Why aren't we doing this today? There are real limits to current human capabilities. What we have is essentially a trade-off between endurance, how long we can operate and survive between successive resupply missions, and crew size or population size. Examples of what is possible on Earth today, the green dots, are the Biosphere 2 experiment of the 1990s, where eight people lived in a materially closed artificial ecosystem for two years. Another example, long-range submarines that can be on station for six months with a crew of close to 100. In space, the blue dots, we started with short stays, as in the uh, Mercury and Gemini missions, followed by two-week excursions to the moon with a crew of three, and today, rotations on ISS with a crew of six for six months. What we envision is to push into the upper right corner of this chart. We want to build an outpost on the moon with a crew of four to six, followed by a habitat on Mars for a crew of six to eight for 500 days, and again followed by a colony on Mars with a population size of about 150. Much longer term, larger settlements, such as the rotating Stanford Taurus, have been proposed with a human population of 10,000 indefinitely. Now, these concepts have been proposed, but so far, they're only a dream. So what will it take to bring this dream to reality? There are primarily four challenges we need to overcome. First, environmental control and life support systems. Recycling everything at much higher levels of efficiency than we can do today. Second, radiation protection. Protecting the human tissues from charged particles and cosmic galactic rays is essential. Third, we need to improve our understanding of human psychology in confined spaces. How can virtual reality simulate larger spaces while maintaining the efficiency of small spaces? And finally, in situ resource utilization. The production of local resources, such as water, oxygen, and minerals, rather than relying on Earth for these. The things we will learn and the technologies we will develop in space will also change the way we live here on Spaceship Earth. But this will not be easy. It will take decades or centuries to accomplish this. But what are a few centuries compared to the long timelines of human civilization and migration? It took tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years for us to fully populate the Earth starting from our origins in Africa and the crossing of Beringia. It has been 500 years since Magellan first circumnavigated the planet. And it took 100 years to fully explore Antarctica and establish a permanent presence there. It has only been 50 years since we landed on the moon. Now, I would like you to consider this. The next time you drink a glass of water, I want you to think, where did this come from? The next time you look at your plants at home, I want you to think about the oxygen they give you by recycling CO2. Establishing humanity as a multi-planet species will not only ensure our survival, it will also expand our collective mind. I hope, I believe, I know that it will happen, because ultimately, it is our destiny. Thank you.